Uh, we read to the kids earlier when we shared with them about the Christmas gift. But uh, it is for by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I don't know if you've ever walked into the dollar store and repeatedly go up to the clerk and ask, how much is this? How much is this? You imagine how that question must grow old for the poor person working at the dollar store. And, uh, you know, the assumption is everything is a dollar, and, uh, and otherwise, don't ask. Now, when it's clearly marked, the price is very clear. To ask how much it is can be wearying. And when God continually pronounces in the scriptures that salvation is free, and we keep asking, how much is it? How much do I have to do? What do I have to do in order to get to heaven? You can imagine in the mind of God how wearying and tiring that really is. And yet, our world is working for heaven. Our world is working for redemption. Our world is working to get past their sins and achieve something beyond this life. We keep asking the question, how much is it? Have I done enough? And when is enough enough? The second largest religion next to Christianity is Islam. Islam literally means submission to the will of Allah. And so there is work involved when you're submitting to the will of Allah where they need to, where their duty is to follow the five pillars of Islam, which is to recite the creed, which is there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the prophet of Allah. And if you keep repeating that sincerely, that makes you Muslim. The second pillar is to pray five times a day facing Mecca. Giving alms, 2.5%. Fasting during the Ramadan season. And a pilgrimage, which is a visit to Mecca. If you do that and other duties like jihad, and, and which has different meanings to different uh, Muslims, but those duties will bring you to that point of being accepted by God. But duties is amounted to work. And so when we think about Christianity, where the Bible says it is free, it is a gift from God, in contrast to the Muslim religion of works, we see that there is quite a contrast between grace and works. Another large religion, Hinduism, 800 million followers, one-sixth of the world's population. They worship 330 million gods. 330 million gods and goddesses that they seek to appease through sacrifices. And so if you're trying to appease God through sacrifices, that is a religious work. That is a religious duty. They do what is called, well, they, they look at karma. Karma literally means a deed or an act. That which cause, a deed or an act which causes an effect. And the idea is good karma will return good works to you. Bad karma, well, that will uh, return uh, a negative effect to you. It's divine payback in their mind. But uh, the more karma you collect, you achieve, the more works you accomplish, the better reincarnation status you will have. And after thousands uh, of reincarnations, you might be breaking free or re be released into what they call moksha. And moksha is the idea where you break free from this, that, this cycle of life into their nirvana or, or their, their version of heaven or release. But it's still a religion of works. 340 million followers follow Buddhism. Buddhism seeks to break out of suffering to reach nirvana. It's, it, it broke free from Hinduism several years back, but it's the idea of eliminating your selfish hunger by following the Noble Eightfold Path, 
which you must pursue and do, pursuing this, what they call the middle way between prosperity and poverty and finding this middle way in between and navigating. But it's still based on the individual. It's still based on what you do. And so when you look at the major religions of the world, even Judaism, for many Jews, it's about following the commandments and observing religious ceremonies. And yet, here in America, there are a lot of Jews who don't even believe in God, and for them, it's cultural identity. It is still, though, based on the individual and not completely on the work of Christ. And so when we take a look at the major religions of the world, they are trying to get to heaven by works. When you look here at America and the cults that are in this country, from Mormonism to Jehovah's Witness, where they also have a system of religious works that they need to do to get to heaven, it is still, what can I do to get to heaven? What can I do? How much do I have to do? How much does heaven cost? What's it going to cost me? It is wearing out the gracious God who says it's free, like we wear out the clerk at the dollar store. Even in branches of Christianity, such as Roman Catholicism, they tack on seven sacraments or works that man has to do to do their part. They say Christ did his part. He died on the cross for us. But man has to do their part. And so you need to take mass and you need to be baptized and you, know, you need to do penance and, and all these different things. They have seven of them that no one can ever accomplish. One, because uh, you know, one, one of them is marriage, and then the other one's the priesthood, and you can't be a married priest, so you're only going to, even at best, do six. You know? and, so, and then, if you don't complete all of these things, then you have to go to purgatory, where you individually have to pay for or have your sins purged out of you in this non-biblical, fictional place that even Catholics are wondering whether they should drop that out of their doctrines. But did you know that the Catholics even have a book called the Code of Canon Law, which contains 1,752 laws that determine one's eternal destiny. Right? I mean, ooh, man, which of these 1,752 is going to affect my eternal destiny? And we can make things so complicated when God says free gift. Free gift. Today. I want you to be clear that salvation is not by works, it's not by going to church, it's not getting baptized on January 18th. It is, it is depending and trusting in the complete work of Christ on the cross who paid for our salvation totally. Because there is nothing that man can do to add to our salvation, to pay for for our salvation, to do our part. It's all about what Christ did for us. That is why he says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And I think we can grow up in church, we can spend time in church, and have wonderful Christian parents, have very clear and accurate Bible teachers in junior church and in youth group, and in, uh, in adult small groups, and, and we can be under this great Bible teaching, but we can be so confused about whether we're going to heaven or not that we're not really sure if we're saved. I mean, how many of you, and you don't have to raise your hands, but how many of you say, will say, I know I'm saved because I've accepted the free gift of God? But how many of you will say, well, I'm not really sure if I'm going to heaven or not. I've been coming to church here for 20 years, 10 years, 5 years, 5 months but I don't know if I'm going to go to heaven or not. And so we ask the question today, how do I know if I'm really a Christian? And I think Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 gives us three things that help us to know if we're a Christian. First, when I allow God to pay for what I can't. When I allow God to pay for what I can't. When we see the phrase here that says, for by grace you have been saved. What is grace? We named our first daughter's middle name Carice. Brianna Carice Wong. Carice is the word for grace. And then we named 
our fourth daughter, Callie, her middle name is Grace. So that actually kind of means the same thing. So we have Carice, Brianna Carice and Calissa Grace, named after uh, my grandmother. But, um, but, but re- reflecting the grace of God. Now, what is grace? Now, if somebody gave you a Christmas gift back in the Greek times, you know, it would be a Christmas Carice, right? I mean, Carice is basically a gift. It is grace. It is getting what we don't deserve. Somebody else described it as unmerited favor. Benjamin Warfield described grace as a free sovereign favor to the ill-deserving. Somebody came up with the acrostic for grace. This isn't the one in your notes. But somebody said, and I always like this one, God's riches at Christ's expense for G-R-A-C-E. In the shower this morning, I came up with a new one. Ready? All right, here's my acrostic for grace, G-R-A-C-E. God rescuing a condemned enemy. I hope that's okay. Yeah, you know, well, we'll think about it. Maybe I needed more shower time. But, but it was, uh, uh, but, but God rescuing a condemned enemy. You know, I, I was condemned to an eternity in hell for my sin. I was an enemy that wanted nothing to do with God. You know, my heart fought against God and rebelled against God in my sin. And because of that, I was condemned to an eternity in hell. I didn't deserve heaven. But because God rescued me as a sinner, and he threw out the, 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 uh, the rescue buoy of the Lord Jesus Christ down to earth so that he can pull us to heaven through him, then that is God rescuing a condemned enemy. Donald Gray Barnhouse described grace this way. Love that goes upward is worship. Love that goes outward is affection. Love that stoops is grace. Love that stoops is grace. And so instead of man trying to jump up to heaven or jump up to God, I can get there, I can get there, I can get there. I was really happy the other day. uh, walking through a sports store, and they had a really low hoop, and I was saying, I might have the chance to actually touch that rim, you know, because it was lower down for me. Normally, I have no chance touching the rim, right? Because, and it's just the same way that we try to, try to jump up to heaven. There's no way we can get there, but when love stoops down to pick us up, that's grace. When God brings the Lilliputians up to him, that is grace. And so uh, let me just share with you five thoughts about grace from the scriptures. First, grace is God choosing those who rejected him. Grace is God choosing those who rejected him. You know, it would be like people saying, I don't want to have anything to do with you, but I want to help you. Could you imagine right now? Somebody who is belligerent against the police because Ferguson or whatever, they can't breathe, whatever, you know, they have going on. And and, and so they're really upset at the police. But then something bad happens to them. And they said, oh, who are you going to call? You can't call Ghostbusters. You know, who are you going to call? I'm going to call the police, right? And then the police will go to help someone who said, well, I was just protesting against you. I didn't want to have anything to do with you, but now I need you, right? And so there can be this sense of rejecting an individual, but then somebody is saying, you know, well, you know what? I'm going to help you, and I'm going to protect you. I've been sworn to protect and to serve. You know, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to help you, right? But it's this idea when uh, helping the one who's rejected us. Uh, we might... Uh, Uh, be defiant and saying, I'm not going to go see a doctor. And we prolong that so much, you know, I I don't trust doctors, I don't trust the Medicare system, I don't trust insurance, and I don't trust, you know, managed care, whatever, whatever excuse you have. And then you get so sick, an ambulance comes for you, and then the doctors take care of you anyway. Even when we're belligerent, rejecting any doctor's help, the doctor's going to help us because that's what they do. And that's what God does in his grace. He takes care of sinners who don't want anything to do with God. Look look at Romans 11. 
says, I didn't give you the whole verse in the, in, on your page, but it says, in the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. You know, when we go to the vote, voting booth, we elect officials based on maybe their experience, based on their policies. I'm going to pick a president because I agree with their policy. Or you might even elect just because they're popular. Uh, you know, for whatever reason. You have your reasons to make your choice based on who they are and what they do. But when God chose to elect us, he chose us not based on anything that we've done because all we've ever done is sin against him. He chose us based on his mercy. He chose us based on his grace. You know, it's, it's, you know, having gone through, I forget if we were in seven, eight, or nine orphanages in Tajikistan and Kazakhstan. But, you know, and less than 1% of those kids will ever be adopted. But can, can you imagine that, you know, somebody will go in and say, all right, well, what's this kid going to do for me? What's this kid going to do for me? No, I want to choose so that I can give them a wonderful life. You know, even though they might have a cleft palate, even though they might have a learning disability, even though they might uh, not be able to walk and will require uh, ambulatory assistance for the rest of their life, I want to help them. And if that is an act of grace. It's not, what are these kids going to do for me? Like, we choose a politician. What's that politician going to do for me? It's, how can I help them out of mercy? I want to take them out of their despair and give them a better life. That's grace. That is a choice uh, of God based on his mercy, not based on what we've done, because all we've done is reject him. He chose the one who rejected him. In the same way that God instructed Hose uh, Hosea to marry his harlot wife, to to. Choose to love the one who hurt you and rejected you. Secondly, grace enables us to believe what we've been naturally rejecting. Grace enables us to believe what we've naturally been rejecting. There's a lot of things we don't know how to do. And one thing that we cannot do on our own is to believe in God on our own. When we hear testimonies about all the things we did for us to come to God, that's not exposing the real truth of what happened. The real truth that happens when we come to God is that God gives us everything we need to believe in Him. We can't take credit, oh, God's lucky to have me. Oh, you know, I searched all the religions and you better be glad that I chose Christianity over all these other religions. The, 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 the plain truth of it is in Acts 18.27. When he wanted to go across to Achaia, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he, had when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. Right? So, the, so the, the idea here is that those who believed, believed because of grace. If it wasn't for grace... We would still be in our trespasses and sin. The scripture says no man seeks after God. Nobody on their own seeks after God, the scriptures clearly say. So for us to believe is God's grace enabling us to even consider Christ, to even have him as, as uh, even to be able to have mind open to him. It is the enablement of the grace of God. So God, grace is God choosing those who rejected him. Secondly, grace enables us to believe what we've been naturally rejecting. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He starts our faith. He brings it to fruition. Right? He's the author and finisher, the completer of our faith. We are not. We are not the author of our own faith. He is. And so he brings us about to this place of faith. Third, grace forgives our sin which offended God. Grace forgives our sin which offended God. Ephesians 1.7, in him 
We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to what? The riches of his grace. The riches of his grace. What do the riches of his grace provide? The forgiveness of our trespasses. A trespass is when you step over into a, over a boundary into a place you ought not to go. Right? It, it, the, the, you can trespass onto a neighbor's property. You can trespass onto a company, uh, you know, front door, and then you're into their company when you're not supposed to be. Uh, you can trespass uh, by drinking Pepsi Cola if you work for Coca Cola, right? I mean, that's, that's stepping beyond the lines or the boundaries. And when we step beyond God's boundary of righteousness into unrighteousness, that's a trespass. So that's why he says our trespasses are forgiven in the redemption through his blood. The redemption of his blood is the payment of Jesus' death on the cross when he bled and he died for us. But that all came at the riches of his grace. That's God rescuing a condemned enemy. That's grace. Fourth, God calls a sinner righteous because of what Christ did for us. God calls a sinner righteous because of what Christ did for us. This is the concept of what we would call justification or justify. The, the, the term justify is God legally declaring a sinner righteous. Sometimes a jury can pronounce somebody not guilty. Jury may not always know what they're doing. But, but you know, if the jury says you're not guilty, then the court will consider that. And, uh, you know, or they can called you guilty, even if you're not, I mean, you've been convicted by a jury of your peers, they make a legal statement or a declaration in terms of one's innocent or guilt. Right? I get a chance to make a legal declaration once in a while saying, you are now no longer single, you are now married, because, you know, I can make that legal declaration that you are now married. And so that, uh, in the same way, God changes our legal status from guilty to righteous by what's called justification. He makes that legal call, calling a sinner. Romans 3.24, being justified, that's the legal call that one is righteous, being justified as a gift by his grace, there's grace again, through the redemption or the payment which is in Christ Jesus. And so he justified us as a gift. That idea, gift, uh, or freely, means that there was no cause that compelled God to forgive us. There was no legal pressure. There was no guilt saying, oh, well, you created us. You created us with free will. Man, you better fix this. You know, there wasn't any of that that compelled God to forgive us. He totally did it out of his grace. He justified us freely by his grace. He justified us as a gift by his grace. Freely without a cause. That's the wonderful grace of Jesus. One more from Romans 5.21. Grace gives us eternal life when we deserve death. Grace gives us an eternity in heaven, eternal life when we deserved death. Romans 5.21, so that as sin reigned in death, even so, grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. <clears throat> and so, <clears throat> here we see when sin brought forth the reign of death, the rule of death, the kingdom of death. You know, we all like these kingdom movies and TV shows, right? And, and it's just, oh, well, the kingdom of sin now reigns mankind. The dark side, Star, Star Wars, you know, and, the, and, and the, the bad side of the force. You know, and, and so, so, so now they are ruling, and the, re the result of their rule is death. But then, in contrast, because of Jesus Christ on the cross, there's a new king in town. There's a new ruler. There's, 
there is the good side taking over the dark side. And it is God's grace that would reign through righteousness to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so he didn't just say, forget about it. You know, he didn't say, ah, you know, sometimes somebody does something wrong. and goes, ah, no, no bother. Don't worry about it. As a just God, he couldn't just say to us, ah, hey, don't worry about it, Steve, for what you just did. He had to send a payment. Uh, he had to take care of the penalty of my sin. And that's what Jesus did on the cross, was he took care of my sin. And so that is why through Jesus Christ, our Lord, now I can be granted a righteousness that would make me eligible to heaven because it's not Steve's righteousness that gets him to heaven. Steve's righteousness is shady. Steve's righteousness is incomplete. Steve's righteousness is barely 1% of what God expects. I mean, I'm not even close. I wouldn't even put myself in a 1% category. Right? I mean, we, we don't come close to that righteousness. Um, you, you know, is my righteousness good enough to get me to heaven? You know, I'm trying to uh, improve myself through reincarnation. I'm trying to improve myself through karma. I'm trying to improve myself through religious works. Look at how many sacraments I'm doing. And then I'll get purged of the sacraments that I'm not doing. Right? And so here are all of man's attempts to be righteous. And our righteousness uh, will only amount to filthy, polluted, sneezed-in Kleenex in the eyes of God. God didn't, can't just say, just forget about it. There had to be a payment for my sin, and Jesus bore that. But there has to be a righteousness that exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. There needs to be a righteousness that exceeds any religious leader that's not perfect. There needs to be a, a righteousness that's better than what any pastor can do and what any Christian can do, and that's the righteousness of the perfect man, Jesus Christ. So not only did he forgive our sin, but he gave us his righteousness. So we get to heaven not based on the righteousness we do through our karma or our sacraments or our religious good works or our going to church or our offering or our baptism, but we go through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's how grace reigns through righteousness to eternal life through the means of Jesus Christ our Lord. And so, what are you dependent on to get to heaven? Is it your works? Is it your religious system? Or is it Jesus who paid for the penalty of our sin and gave us his righteousness? Until we understand that meaning of grace, we will not be saved. We are saved by grace alone. And it is grace that enables us to believe. Grace that forgives our sin. Grace that makes us righteous. Grace that gives us eternal life. The second aspect Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us is how do I know if I'm a Christian? When I put my confidence in what Christ did for me on the cross. And that is called faith. It says, through faith, for by grace I have been saved through faith. The word faith, pistuo, uh, no, nobody names your kids pistuo unless you're basketball player Pete Maravich. Pistuo Pete, I think that was his name. But anyway, uh, pistuo means, uh, according to uh, one uh, wordsmither of these ancient words, it's to believe in something, to be convinced of something, to entrust something to another. That's the idea of, uh, of believe, to believe and to be convinced, to entrust something to another. That's by Art and Gingrich. And so um, Charles Ryrie says, faith means confidence, trust, to hold something as true. To have faith in Christ unto salvation means to have confidence that he can remove the guilt of sin and grant eternal life. Now, faith is highly misconstrued in today's world. The world thinks faith is Christians being deceived by the Bible or by some religious 
thinker like Paul on what he thinks Christianity is all about. And Christians are just duped into it. You know, they're gullible. They're, they're, they're looking for a crutch, and this crutch is Christianity and Jesus Christ. Well, truth be said, I am looking for a crutch because I can't walk to heaven on my own. I need help. Uh, and, uh, and, and, but, but the world says, well, you know what? Faith is self-deception. You know, Christians are self-deceived. They're convinced, they're convincing oneself to believe what they know is untrue. You know, and so that's what the world says. How can you believe that Jesus Christ was both God and man? How can you believe he was born of a virgin? How can you believe he rose from the dead? You know, and they ask all of these questions. Uh, Christians just need to be deluded. Bertrand Russell, an atheist, quoted him last week, but Bertrand Russell said this. He said, faith is a conviction which cannot be shaken by contrary evidence. Right? He's just saying, you guys are stupid believing this Christianity. That's what he's saying. Another fellow by the name of Ambrose Bierce said, faith is belief without evidence in what is told by one who speaks without knowledge of things without parallel. Right? Here is just this ridicule saying, oh, you know, faith is self-deception, self-deceit. But the Bible says... Faith is rational reality. It is understanding that what, that what God is saying is true, and he invites us to reason with him together. Come, let us reason that your sins, though they be red as scarlet, may be washed white as snow. Uh, uh, Paul, when he was in Athens dealing with the philosophies of those days, was they're reasoning with them with the Word of God. So there is a reasonableness. Christianity, the Bible, is not asking for blind faith in what we know is not true. We are being asked to take that which is the truth of God, find that reasonable. Can you find a reasonable alternative to the fact that Jesus rose again? There's been all these other theories. Uh, oh, he got... He, he, you know, he was stolen by the disciples, or, or he was just merely knocked out. And, and then, you know, he was, uh, even though he lost so much blood and was weak and was thirsty and dehydrated, he pushed that two-ton rock away and fought through all of those soldiers. And, you know, and then, you know, he was okay again. Like, that's reasonable. You know, those are, there has not been a reasonable theory that can explain away the resurrection other than it really happened. With 500 witnesses. Is that reasonable? You know, and so, so we're asked to take the truth of the Word of God to find that reasonable. It, it is not about, it is not being deceived. It is about coming to, to uh, the confidence that God's Word is true. The fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies are amazing. The fact of Christ's death and its, its effect on sin, the fact of his resurrection and how his resurrected life has changed so many lives. Another criticism that the world has about faith is that it's just mental assent. All you got to do is know something uh, and you acknowledge the truth. But the Bible says faith involves more than just what you know. It involves action. It involves action. It is a spiritual action. It is relying on truth. It is looking at this table and saying, you know, I could put my weight on it. Well, I don't know if I can. I ate a lot during Christmas. You know, but, but, you know, but when, you, when you sat down on the pew today, you know, you just you acted by faith that that pew is going to hold you. There was spiritual action. Now, mental ascent would be looking at, okay, I think that pew can hold me, but you don't sit in it. A spiritual action says, I rely on it. Somebody can say, well, I know that there's a God and that God exists and that God created the world, you know, but to rely on the fact that Jesus Christ is our Savior takes spiritual action. The world also criticizes faith by calling it blind faith. He says, because you can't see it, it must not be real. There was this young pastor's kid told by his mother to wash his hands because there were germs in this caked, full of dirt hands. And then he started complaining, germs in Jesus, germs in Jesus. That's all I ever hear around this house, and I've never seen either one. Germs in Jesus. 
Uh, but just because you can't see them doesn't mean that they're not there. There is the invisible side. There is the invisible aspect of life. Seeing is not always believing. But what the Bible calls for is not a blind faith and, and just put your faith in, you know, and, and just blindly into something that you don't know is, or see or is evident. But faith is described in Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Our pastors and uh, wives, we had the opportunity to go see the movie uh, before it was released, the Unbroken movie. I don't know how many of you saw that over the, the Christmas weekend. And then last night, Daisy and I watched this really cool Fox documentary on, uh, uh, on Greta Van Susteren. On, on, look that up later, too. That, that was a really good program. Talking about the, the life of Louis Zamperini, who was the subject of this movie, Unbroken. He grew up in Torrance, California, was nicknamed the, the Torrance Tornado. He was a, a USC track star and was in the Olympics, even meeting uh, Hitler. Uh, because of the way that he ran that 5,000-meter race, being the youngest qualifier. He was the roommate of Jesse Owen. And, um, uh, and he set the collegiate mile record at 4 minutes and 21 seconds, which lasted uh, 15 years, that, that record stood. And, um, but he, he got drafted into uh, the military uh, he enlisted in the, uh, well, no, he enlisted in the Army Air Force in 1941 and, uh, and was, was sent on these different missions and, and the, the movie beautifully depicts several, uh, you know, this aspect of the World War II aspect of his life. And, uh, and you know, the long and short of it was uh, he, he was on a rescue mission, his plane uh, crashes because it wasn't a very good plane. Uh, everybody dies except three of them. They spend 47 days on a life raft, and then they get rescued by the Japanese enemy who brings them into this prisoner camp. He was going to be executed, but the only reason why he was kept alive was because he was an Olympic hero. So they kept him alive because they wanted to use him to go out on Tokyo radio uh, to give propaganda that was pro-Japanese, and he wouldn't do that. He was beaten on a regular basis, and, uh, and you know, and the story with the bird, you know, is, is there for you to see in the movie or in the book Unbroken by Lauren Hildenbrandt. He was in the same camp as great Pappy Boyington, you know, if you remember the Baba Black Sheep uh, TV show. But, but, you know, eventually when the war ends, he comes home, and that's all we really see in the movie. The tremendous... I mean, that was tremendous, you know, but by no means. But the transforming part of his life was what happened afterwards. He came home, he got married, but the, the horror that he faced in those Japanese uh, prisoner of war camps were just so horrific that it led him to drinking, it led him to uh, strangling his wife one night, and he just, uh, uh, you know, thinking that she was this bird who had tortured him. And... Um, and, and and she was ready to leave him. But then his wife, Cynthia, gets saved at a, at a Billy Graham crusade. And then she persuades him to come at, to the Billy Graham crusades, which he says, no, he doesn't want to have anything to do with it. But she persuades him, and he goes one night when he's preaching down in L.A. And <clears throat> he didn't like what he was hearing, and he walked out of the first night. So wife compelled him to go back again, and, uh, and it was, um, and as Billy Graham spoke, he still didn't want to hear it. He was still resisting, but Billy Graham spoke of how God rescues those who are, you know, out on the sea of despair. And then he starts thinking back to a promise he made when he was on that life raft. God, if you save me, I'll serve you forever. And so as he starts thinking back on that, he comes to a point of faith and and, uh, and as I was reading the book Unbroken, page 375, Warren Hillenbrand writes it just so beautifully. She says this, What God asks of men, said Graham, is faith. His invisibility is the truest test of that faith. To know who sees him, God makes himself unseen. I, I thought that was such a profound statement. To know 
who sees him, God makes himself unseen. God makes himself invisible. He makes himself unseen so he will know those who see him. Wow, I have not thought of faith in that way. But, but that's, that, that is relevant to Hebrews 11.1, 1, and, and uh, where faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so faith involves three things. It does involve an understanding. There, there needs to be a knowledge of fact. It, it is also emotional, where there is a confidence in the truth. But it also involves an act of the will, which is a commitment through trust. Uh, Burkhoff describes these three elements of faith as intellectual, he calls it in the Latin, noticia. Emotional, he calls it a census in the Latin. Volitional, fiducia, which he calls it in the Latin. But it's these, these three aspects of faith, understanding it, what Christ did for you, having confidence in what Christ did, uh, that he paid for the penalty of my sin, and then committing myself through trust in what Jesus Christ did on the cross for my sin. That's what faith is. So, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Through faith. One last thought here from verse 9. How do I know when I'm a Christian? When I yield to the work of Christ and not personal works to get to heaven. I'm depending on the work of Christ, not the work of Steve, not the work of FBC or at FBC. I am re- not relying on the church. I'm relying on Christ. I'm not relying on myself. I'm relying on Christ. I'm not relying on religion. I'm not relying on a book. I'm relying on Jesus Christ, death on the cross. That's why he says, it is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Augustine wrote, if you believe what you like in the gospel, and reject what you don't like, it is not the gospel you believe, but yourself. How many of us are here today saying, well, I don't like that aspect of the gospel. I think I'll just believe this part of it. Oh, you know, you know I'm, I'm a little more pro on the love side, but the, the whole judgment justice side, I don't want to deal with it. You know, if you don't want to deal with sin, then what are you saved from? If you don't want to think about hell, what has Jesus rescued us from? We can't take what we want from the gospel and say, oh, you know, I'm just going to take the, the lovey parts and I'm going to reject all this justice part. Jesus Christ went to the cross for justice sake. For my hell sake. And he bore that death on the cross for my sin. So just three thoughts here, because I'm not going to elaborate on it. It is a, a gift is free to the beneficiary. Uh, a gift is free to the beneficiary. It's a gift, like we showed the kids earlier. A gift, it, it, during this Christmas, you didn't ask the kids to pay five bucks for, for the gift. You didn't ask the kids to do jumping jacks. You didn't ask them to wash the dishes before you would give them a gift. A gift is a gift. It's to be received. It's to be re- or rejected. But it is not paid for. It's free to the beneficiary. That's why it is the gift of God. Then he says it is not of works. A work is contrary to grace. A work is contrary to grace. If you're thinking, well, I I don't deserve to go to heaven. That's true. But even though we don't deserve to go to heaven, that doesn't mean that we can do good works to start deserving heaven. Because we're sinners. We don't deserve a perfect heaven. Uh, And so he gives it to us by grace. God rescuing a condemned enemy. He does the full rescue. We don't. And then a boast is reserved for the giver, not the beneficiary. A boast is reserved for the giver, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The beneficiaries... You know, we don't start boasting, oh, you know, look what I paid for. You didn't pay for that. Your parents gave you that Christmas gift. You know, oh, you know, I got this Razor scooter. You know, look what I did. Your parents gave it to you. You know, and so, so, so the boasting is for the giver, not the beneficiary. And that's why we give praise and glory to his name. We boast about Christ and his salvation, 
We don't boast about, look what I did to get to heaven. That's why there's that contrast between the religious Pharisee who says, I thank God I'm not like that tax collector. You know, and, and there was that arrogance who, where, where he was grateful that he wasn't a worse sinner uh, that society thinks was horrific. But Jesus said, the faith of the tax collector who beat his chest and said, have mercy upon me, a sinner. There's no boasting there. There's no boasting saying, have mercy on me, a sinner. A boast is reserved for the giver, not the beneficiary. And this is echoed, 1 Corinthians 1.29, so that no man may boast before God. 1 Corinthians 1.31, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3.21, so then let no one boast in men, for all things belong to you. Right? And so, so that's where the boasting goes. It goes towards God and what he did. So are you a Christian? You are not a Christian because you come to Fellowship Bible Church. I'm glad you came. We love having you. But coming to church doesn't make you a Christian. Being born in a Christian family doesn't make you a Christian. Getting baptized doesn't make you a Christian. It makes you wet. Putting your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation, that's how you become a Christian. But you don't do it yourself. He gives you the ability to believe. He brings you to himself. He gives you his righteousness. Everybody is trying to work their way to heaven in all these other religions. And even in some confused quadrants of Christianity, that's not following the word of God. Let's not be part of that confusion. Let it be clear. We are believers because of the grace of God. For by grace, we have been saved through faith. It's not of works, lest any man should boast. It's by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. There was this argument going on a few years back of um, what makes Christianity unique over other religions. And, and there was this argument going on, and some of the participants argued that Christianity is unique in teaching that God became a man, and others said, well, no, there's some other religions that might teach that. Someone uh, said, well, how about the resurrection? And it was argued that there were some other faiths that believed that the dead rise again. And so this debate just kind of grew heated. And then in walks C.S. Lewis, who is a, a wonderful defender of the Christian faith. And he, he, he asked, well, what's all this ruckus going about? And he learned that it was a, a debate about the uniqueness of Christianity, to which he immediately commented, oh, you know what makes Christianity unique? That's easy. Grace. Grace. Grace is what makes Christianity different from all other religions because grace is what love stooping down god rescuing a condemned enemy that, that's love stooping down where everybody's trying to i can make it i can make it i can make it to heaven oh i'm trying i'm climbing i'm playing oh i'm getting tired oh you know i don't know if i can do that you know it's just uh you, you know we, my, my wife last year went uh, on this cruise together and uh and, and it was a really nice cruise got a really really cheap deal you know, on that, that, uh, that discount cruise website, last-minute cruises. And so, so we, 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 we booked a cruise, and it was really neat. On the ship, it had this, um, this rock climbing thing. And so we said, oh, you know, well, let's try it. You know, we want to try all these different things on the, on the, on the ship. And so, um, so we went out there rock climbing, you know. And then I saw all these, like, these old ladies that were overweight, and, you know, and they were up there, and they were climbing, and they were doing really good. And, and, I, said, and I was, you know, I was kind of thinking, well, you know, I think maybe if they could do it, maybe I could do it. And then, uh, and so I let my wife go first. And then, you know, she got up kind of so high. And then I tried it. I could not get three feet off the ground. Right? It was just horrible. It was just, uh, here I was, you know, and then, you know, and, you know, and all these, you know, all, all these other people, you know, just, they go halfway and they get up. I, I couldn't get, you know, three little knobs off the ground. You know, just horrible. Everybody's saying, use your legs. You know, I was using my arm. I just, 
I, you know, I try to do it by arm, you know, I'm just kind of thinking, oh, you know, I'm Mr. Incredible. Yeah, no. You know, and, and there was just no way I was going to have that wall. That, 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 that trek to heaven is just like Steve trying to go up through a rock climbing wall. It's not going to happen. All right, we're going to tire out and then, you know, you know, I, I, I never posted the pictures, but I only got that high. All right. I mean, that, that's, that's as far as I got. It's just ridiculous. And, and that is as ridiculous. My wife got higher than I did. You know, she, she, she got up there pretty far. I was proud of her. But, but, you know, that's like us trying to go to heaven. That's our own effort. You know, and what I needed was that, what do you call him, a belayer or whatever? The, well, the guy, you know, you know, it would have been good. He just pulled me all the way up, right? That would have been great. That's what I needed, to be pulled all the way up. That's what we need before God. We need to be pulled all the way up. He needs to pull us. He pulls us all the way up by grace. What we need to do is put our faith in him. Have you done that? Will you do that? Let's bow our heads. I don't want to end this year with anybody confused about Christianity and anybody deceived about their salvation. If you think that your own self efforts, your own religious works is going to get you to heaven. Man, you're rock climbing like me. That's what you're doing. Trying to get to heaven. Like I'm trying to rock climb. And, and may, may the reality of grace and faith and the work of Jesus Christ, may that be your hope for salvation. I hope the gospel has been clear today. I hope grace and faith has been crystal clear to you today that we can't do it on our own. If you've been trying to do it on your own, will you repent from that and say, I'm going to trust in Jesus Christ alone for my Savior. Right? If, if you've been running towards sin, will you repent of that and saying, I'm going to trust in Jesus Christ as the one who paid for my sin when I was running away. I'm going the other way and he's choosing me in my rebellion. His grace is wonderful that way. But we must depend fully on what he does. He will pull you all the way up. We can't climb to heaven on our own. Today, if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, would you put your faith in him and trust in his total grace of salvation and heaven for you? All you have to do is recognize the reality of your sinfulness before God. That our sin is condemnation worthy. We deserve it because of our sin. But because of the wonderful love of God, He didn't want us to be stuck in our sin and in judgment and in hell. He wanted us to be with Him. So we had to, number one, forgive our sin, and then number two, give us His righteousness. And when we put our faith in the work of Jesus Christ on the cross... It says that he gives us righteousness and forgiveness of sin and eternal life. But it is by faith alone, not of works. Otherwise, we'd be boasting in heaven about how we got there. Would you put your trust in Jesus Christ today, right now? If that's your heart's desire and you've never done that before or you want to make sure that you are saved when you've just been confused about it, raise your hand that I could pray for you. Would you like to trust Jesus Christ today? Our precious Heavenly Father, thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. Thank you for Jesus Christ who has done it all and so that all we need to do is put our faith in Him. It's not a license for us to continue to sin, it is, but it is... It is the reality that there's just no way we can work for heaven. Thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ who has done it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Join us in Sunday School next door for our equip session. May the Lord bless you today.